I want to read some new reporting that um, NBC has um, to you, Mike, because it, it sort of it sort of bears out Claire's point. Uh, Mark Short, who testified, it, it would appear reluctantly by saying things like, I'm here under subpoena and going on Fox News and saying, yes, I cooperated with the January 6th committee, but I had to. I was subpoenaed. Mark Short, of course, is the chief of staff to the vice president. His testimony was used in, in um, the tape depositions that were shown during that rather dramatic um, public hearing where uh, Greg Jacobs, who was his counsel, testified to never before publicly aired evidence that the vice president refused to get in the car and basically ran the executive branch of the government from the basement of the United States Capitol, where he waited um, until it was safe to go upstairs and, and certify President Biden's victory. So this has been reported since we've been on the air. Um, a source familiar with the matter tells NBC News that Mark Short, who was chief of staff to Vice President Pence, appeared last week under subpoena before a Washington, D.C. federal grand jury investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The development was first reported by ABC News. The source wouldn't discuss details of the testimony, but Short's grand jury appearance is an indication that the Department of Justice's investigation into January 6 has expanded beyond those who attacked the Capitol and those involved in the so-called fake elector schemes. So maybe, maybe a brick in the wall against Claire and, and Andrew's pessimism? Look, it, um, it would certainly be a sign that the Justice Department investigation being led by Thomas Wyndham is looking at and trying to talk to individuals at that closest rung around the president. That has sort of been the biggest question to this point, is that why is it that people like Mark Short had not been talked to, but they had talked to the committee? So this would certainly be a sign that the department is, is honing its focus directly in on those individuals and trying to get information from them. It's important to remember what Short was was there for. He was there for the efforts by Eastman and Trump to pressure Pence. He was helping to respond to that. He was helping make sure that Greg Jacob was coming up with a legal rationale that Pence could rely on, uh, coordinating with uh conservative lawyers outside the administration who were trying to help Pence. He was at the center of all of these things and dealing directly with Pence as Pence had to confront Eastman and Trump as they came up with this, this bogus legal scheme to where they essentially said that Pence could pick the president in when he went for the certification. So it's not just that Short is in the Capitol on January 6th and witnesses what is going on with Pence and Pence's reluctance to leave and the violence there. He was directly uh, a direct witness to everything that was going on in terms of the internal pressure campaign on Pence. Andrew Weissman, I want your thoughts on everything Mike is reporting, but, but he's also an important witness in the knowledge 24 hours ahead of time that there would be violence and the violence would be directed at uh, Mike Pence. He calls in the Secret Service, who have now become sort of the flashing yellow light in, the, in, in all of the questions about who knew what and when. He knows 24 hours before January 6 goes down the way it does that Pence is in danger. And he calls in Secret Service and tells them on the 5th, hey, Pence could be in a dicey situation tomorrow. Talk about Short's testimony and knowledge 24 hours ahead of time of violence. So um, the violence is incredibly important in terms of proving a case, um, particularly if you're trying to make a case on seditious conspiracy uh, against the former president, because that requires the Department of Justice to prove um, that there was obstruction of Congress by force. So his awareness the day before and who he can say was also aware of it, for sure the Secret Service was aware of it. So the idea that the president of the United States was unaware would, would seem laughable. So he's an important witness to that. As Mike points out, he's also an important witness to um, the president lying about saying the vice president was always on board with the fact that he, he agrees that, he, that the president um, uh, says that the vice president does not have to count the votes, that he has the power to say no when we know that the vice president's view was, no, he doesn't have the power. So he's an incredibly important witness. And I also think if that reporting is correct, the fact that the Justice Department is putting him in the grand jury is really good practice. In a political corruption case, 
just interviewing people is rarely sufficient. You have to lock people in under oath. Um, there's no better way than to do that in a grand jury. So they can't later uh, sort of wriggle out and say that the FBI, whoever's taking notes, you know, misinterpreted what was said. So the fact that he went into the grand jury would be, I think, very significant. And it seems that, Claire, if, if the violence is what is under scrutiny or, or becomes something that's under scrutiny, or, or I guess we already know that the violence carried out by the insurrectionists is under investigation. They're, they're charging them, they're trying these cases, they're winning these cases. The, the, the date on, on knowledge of violence, is, I mean, at least from Short's testimony, is, is the fifth. But Cassidy Hutchinson testifies that on the second, Rudy says, make sure Trump goes. It's going to be wild. And on the second, Meadows knows it's going to be, quote, real, real bad. So you've got, got Meadows, who knows on the second, and Rudy, who knows on the second, it's going to be really violent. You've got Short, who knows on the fifth, it's going to be violent. You've got Trump, who knows that the weapons are there. Once the mag's down, so the armed supporters with AR-15s in the trees can come on in. And then on the seventh, he can't say you're not with us. The opposite of that is you are with us. He can't say you will be prosecuted. The opposite is you won't be prosecuted. How is Trump not the beating heart of the violence? Uh, there's, he is the beating heart of the violence. He's the first one who said it will be wild. And then all of his minions took up the cause. Um, I, I think the evidence is, is very clear. And I think what Andrew pointed out earlier is huge, that in that statement he made, he lied. He never called the National Guard. He never called anybody except Rudy and some <laughs> senators continuing to try to get them to obstruct uh, 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 an act of Congress. So the only calls he made were to his pretend lawyers and to his sycophants in Congress. He never he never called law enforcement, never called the National Guard. All of this is very compelling. And, but I would just point out again that the added problem the Department of Justice has now, yes, it's great they're getting the, this testimony in front of a grand jury under oath. But every single witness that is key to this now has another set of statements. And I can mm. assure you, no matter how good a witness is, every statement they give is slightly different. And that is grist for cross-examination. Well, you said this on this day. You didn't say it this way on this day. And sometimes the littlest of differences that really didn't mean anything get blown out of proportion in front of a jury. So that's why it's so important that typically law enforcement wants to be the first one to get someone down in terms of what happened. Now there's gonna be a lot of different statements in front of the committee on depositions, recorded statements, interviews that they're gonna to have to deal with, assuming they might go forward. Andrew Weissman, let me ask you about the FBI. Um, we, we talk about Merrick Garland, we, we, we talk about um, how they will, whatever happens next, it will follow the congressional probe, it will follow Fonnie Willis. Um, where's the FBI? in all this. Are they capable of initiating and driving the need to investigate crimes? That is such a great question, particularly if you focus on one aspect that we know is being investigated, which is the sort of Department of Justice scheme, and that involves um, John Eastman and uh, Jeffrey Clark, and that for you know people who are not following the details, that is the scheme to um, lop off the um, heads of the uh, Justice Department who are unwilling to go along with the scheme to say that there was fraud in the election um, and to issue a letter saying that that's under investigation. By all accounts, that is being investigated by the Inspector General's office, which is a, a sort of small, unique part of the Justice Department, but not by the FBI. That's very unusual. Um, yeah. I had thought that the inspector general would work with the FBI. When I was in the department, I frequently um, would have an investigation with the FBI and the inspector general's office because you want those added resources and that expertise um, of the FBI. Um, so, but it's really worth remembering the FBI reports to the deputy attorney general and the attorney general. So, you know, if Merrick Garland uh, wants the FBI involved, he has the power to make that happen.